Um, the Sabbath was Saturday, and uh, we're going to learn today that Christ filled the Sabbath by bringing us into the rest of God. And because of us enjoying that rest, we no longer celebrate the Sabbath, we celebrate the Lord's Day. Sunday is the Lord's Day. The early church gathered on Sunday because Christ rose from the dead on Sunday. And so by being here, we proclaim to one another that Christ is alive and that He's returning soon to get us. And we only proclaim it to one another. We proclaim it to a watching world. And so we hope to enjoy the Lord here today. Brief announcements. Um, last night, I want to thank everybody who helped uh, with the Fall Festival. I thank Michelle. Thank you, Michelle, for planning that and organizing that. And um, everybody did a great job. Last year, I want to say we had between 150 and 200. Last night, we probably had 1,000 people that came, that came through. So we, we planned for 200. And, uh, you know, so we were very surprised. Um, but next year, we'll, do our, we'll do, try to do a better job preparing for a larger number of people. Um, that, it, and that may be one of the biggest events that this church has ever put on. All, all the years of service here. So I thank everybody who labored for that and labored to put that in. I want to encourage you uh, next year uh, to consider helping because with that many people, we need all, of, need all of you to come and to help uh, prepare and to help reach out to all those people. And we really, it's really an awesome opportunity uh, to share the gospel. And the puppets did a great job and just everybody who trunk or treat and the food. And I think they gave, we, they gave away 200 hot dogs in like 20 minutes. The, so we, we prepared for 200 people. So we, we were out of food in the first 20 minutes. Uh, then they bought more. And within 20 minutes, it was gone. And so it was, uh, it was really a, a great time. And uh, be in prayer for those who received the tracts that we handed out and that the Lord would move through those, move through His Word, and convict folks to consider the claims of Christianity, just how amazing it is to be saved. You'll notice that uh, tonight is uh, the hayride. Right for the youth, and um, it starts. What time does it start, brother? Five o'clock. Five o'clock here. Five o'clock here for the hay ride tonight, guys and gals. If you have any questions, you can see brother Michael. Brother Michael will share more about that at the end of service. And you'll notice coming up that this Saturday is a sleeping mat workshop, nine to eleven a.m. So the Mad Matters are going to be meeting. We're making mats for the homeless. So if you want to help with that, please see Miss Donna, and then Young at Heart. It is uh, November the 9th, which is a Thursday at 12 o'clock. So I want to encourage you to come participate in that, come participate in that food. And then remember as well that November the 18th is a cooking for the king. And there, there are these, these uh, forms to fill out. Uh, I believe there's some in the foyer back there. Ms. Reba has some as well. And uh, Ms. Reba, when you, what about the, the handbells? If folks are interested in the handbells, they come see you. What age? What age? What age? Are youth age and up? Okay, so if you're in the youth, youth age and older, if you want to help the handbell ministry, please see Miss Reba. Right? Please see Miss Reba. Any other announcements? Anything else? All right. Well, let's prepare hearts for worship. The way we do that is by coming and admitting that we need the one we're about to sing to one that we're about to sing about. So between you and the Lord, if you have any unconfessed sin, confess it to the Lord at this time. And because we're going to approach you and let's get up and sing by someone who's been forgiven. Let's bow together. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the opportunity to, to come and to bring your, our burdens and our concerns and lay them at your feet today together. And Lord, to not pick them up again, but to embrace you, to enjoy you, Lord. If our sins have been forgiven and we are no longer children of wrath, then what do we really have to fear in this life? Lord, if you've got a hold of us, no one can snatch us away. So Lord, may we get up and sing like the redeemed. May we sing like those whose sins have been cleansed. And may we sing like those whose eternity has been secured by you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, let's stand and encourage one another in the name of Christ here this morning.
Mary Brown on the beacon of the week is next week. Uh, my telephone number is in the bulletin. Uh, you can contact that church office. If you need any help or contact me or one of the other deacons, we'll be happy to help you. Uh, let's go to the prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we can gather together and worship thee. And Father, for the opportunity to return to you a portion of what you have given to us. Pray, Lord, now that you use it for the update of thy kingdom. And for in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Andrew guy. I can text you some good. You're in Canada now, aren't you?
God, the Father and the Son, Lord, I ain't no stranger now. Just over in the glory land. 
I long for the day when I'm with the Lord. I mean, that's the, the goal is uh, to be with Him forevermore. And you know, uh, the fact that Christ has bore our sin on the cross and our belief in Him and what He has done for us and trusting in Him. You know, we can sing songs of hope. We can sing songs that are factual, that aren't you know, maybe I'll make it to the glory land. Or, you know, you don't hear many Christian songs. Like that. Um, and there's good reason for it. Because the Bible um, is pretty clear concerning uh, where we're going to spend eternity. And the Bible is very clear about where we already are. I mean, in one sense, the moment you repent and believe, you're already in the glory land. Your name is already in the Lamb's Book of Life. Your sins have already been forgiven, cleansed. Uh, there's a sense where you're already there because Christ is there and you're in Christ. You're joined to Christ through the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, part of His ministry is to unite us to Jesus Christ. And so we no longer wear our own name, but we wear the name of Christ. We don't baptize in our own name. We baptize in the name of Christ. The list goes on and on and on about who we are in Christ. And today we're particularly looking at, uh, at rest at rest in God, you'll find in the Old Testament that rest is a theme um, where God promises His people on many occasions that He will give them rest from their enemies. And um, the author of Hebrews is going to go as far back to the beginning of God made creation. And he's going to argue that part of Sabbath rest was to point to um, the new heaven, the new earth as an entire Sabbath where there is just a constant resting from our works. And if you're already in Christ, then you are resting from your good works, particularly concerning earning your salvation. You know, you're able to rest in the fact that your good works do not save you, but Christ's good work. So while you're, you get to rest because Christ finished His work. And so you get to rest eternally. In the Lord. You know, when I was growing up, we often made fun of my mom and dad, me and my sisters, because they couldn't stay awake for a movie. You know, if they ever sat down after they got done working, or if we ever went to the movie theater, mom would be asleep in like the first 20 minutes, didn't matter what the movie was. And so it was just pointless really to go to the movie theater. Um, but we would make fun of them and give them a hard time. And I understand that more now. Um, but, after four kids, my mom had four children as well. Um, but once I moved out of the house, mom told me a story about her and dad. She said, uh, you know, they were both retired. Well, she, she had been disabled, but she, had, she was two years from retirement whenever she had to quit working. And she said one day, uh, when she was napping, dad was awake watching TV, and the phone rang, and the phone is on her side, you know. Do y'all have chairs in your house that are yours? And spots that are yours. Well, my mom and dad had spots that are theirs. And next to mom's spot was the phone. And so the phone rang. And instead of grabbing the phone, she grabbed a remote. And she picks it up. She said, hello? 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 And dad's just hee-hawing, laughing at her. And so she puts it down. And she's still, she's groggy. Well, nobody answered the phone. So the person calls back. And she grabs the remote again. <laughs> She's trying to answer the remote. And she realizes it and then gets the phone. But Dad just laughed and laughed and laughed at her um, for that. And some of y'all have probably answered the remote before. Um, you know, I say all that to say that, that we need rest. We have a constant reminder. Mankind has a constant reminder that we need rest. Um, and I believe that that is a, a picture, a point. God is making a point that we need final rest, that we need eternal rest. I mean, God could have made humanity without any need of rest. I mean, he, obviously the angels don't rest. Um, I mean, he could have made us without that need. But it has to do, I believe, ultimately with redemption. You know, even, it's amazing. Both, even folks who don't believe in God, say they don't believe in God, even people who worship false gods, cannot get away from the fact that our God made everything. 
Every time they go to sleep, they proclaim that God made them. And their desperate need for rest. We all need that. And I want you to think about each time you're sleepy, each time your body screams for rest, remember that your ultimate need is not temporary rest and not to go to sleep at night, but your ultimate need is to rest in God, to rest from your enemies, to rest from death, to rest from the persecutors of the church, to rest from sin. You know, some glorious reality is that in Christ, you are already resting from the penalty of sin because Christ endured your penalty on the cross. And so you no longer have to fear paying the ultimate penalty for your sin because Christ has made full atonement for you. So you can rest in a way that others cannot. Even whenever you're, even whenever you're working, you can rest in that eternal reality. The author of Hebrews understood this and he wanted his hearers to understand it as well. He wanted you and I to understand that we in Christ are resting in God and too that we need to pursue this rest in God. You know, I was hoping I'd sound like Johnny Cash today with being hoarse, but I think you got Johnny Cash when he's like 14. <laughs> and so you'll just, just bear with me. The Word of God is powerful and can change people's lives even when a 14-year-old Johnny Cash gets up and preaches. All right, so look in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. We're going to talk about resting in God, and we must pursue rest in God. The first point I want you to see is the way that we pursue rest in God is by remembering that we entered His rest through faith in Christ. Okay, so if you have repented and believed in Christ and you're continuing to repent and believe in Christ, then you are resting. You're resting from sin's penalty. You're resting from sin's penalty in Christ. And so I have no fear of hell. I have no fear of enduring the penalty that Christ endured for me since Christ is divine and human. You have Him able to satisfy God's wrath because He's God. So His sacrifice is an infinite worth because He's infinite. Right? So that infinite atoning sacrifice is able to atone for our sins eternally. And so it's not that Christ atoned just for my past sin, and now I've got to somehow do something to have the rest of my sins atoned for, like pray a prayer before I die. No, I confess my sins to my Father. I don't confess my sins to my enemy. I confess my sins to my Father. Not so he'll keep being my father, but because he is my father. I never confess my sins to God as a Christian in fear of hell. Ever. Now I fear his righteous justice the same way I would fear my daddy's justice if I did something contrary to what he told me to do. But I never fear God as if he is a judge ready to pounce on me. Because Christ died for me, and God has judged my sin in Christ. He declared Christ guilty. Make me free. So enjoy that freedom. Enjoy someone. Enjoy being forgiven by God. Enjoy resting in God. We see in the first five verses here, Therefore, while the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as He has said, As I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although His works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he is somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And again in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Now, remember that he was talking about Israel perishing in the wilderness in the previous chapter. And so remember that God led Israel out of Egypt, right? So he did all these marvelous works in front of them. You know, he, he used Moses, he used the shepherds, basically, 
um, to lead them out of Egypt, to lead them out of slavery to a land flowing with milk and honey. And so God punished uh, Pharaoh. He, the Bible says that he allowed him to rise to power for the purpose of showing his own glory and defeating Pharaoh. And so they walked across the Red Sea on dry land, right? The water came down and destroyed Pharaoh's army. And they're led by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I mean, to show them that Yahweh is with them. I mean, it's just an amazing story. And they get to Canaan. They get to the promised land, what had been prophesied hundreds of years earlier. And here they are. They're there. They're ready to cross over. And they send in 12 spies. 10 of them come back and say, land's flowing with milk and honey. But these are mighty men. We cannot surely defeat them. There's two of them, though, Caleb and Joshua, who say, Yahweh will deliver them into our hands. And so the majority won. And they ended up wandering 40 years in the wilderness, the Bible says. And as a result, they perished. And author of Hebrews is picking this up, and he's using it to warn us that even though we claim to be the people of God, we have a responsibility to live out the Christian life. Because I cannot look in your heart, you cannot look in my heart and tell whether or not we're Christians, right? So the way that you know, who, who is he saying had faith? Those who were disobedient or those who were obedient? Those who were obedient is what he's saying. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying. And so we have a responsibility to live out the Christian life. Not so that we'll be saved, but it shows our salvation. You know, in the Bible, it has this throughout. That we have a responsibility to walk in the Spirit. You know, that when in Galatians, when the Apostle Paul is talking about walking in the Spirit, he says that we, if you live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit. So in other words, if you've been resurrected by the Spirit, you know, every Christian has the Holy Spirit. If you've got the Holy Spirit, walk in the Spirit. In other words, live out the Christian life. Live for God's glory. So you're no longer living for yourself. You're living for God's glory. And that's what he's emphasizing. He's emphasizing the responsibility of the believer. So it's not just our profession of faith. It's we need to live out our profession of faith. In other words, you and I do what we believe. And so if we are struggling with sin, we need to, the answer is to believe God more. The answer is to believe Christ more. Right? Now, it only takes a little faith to save us. Faith of a child. Just a small amount of faith. That of a mustard seed. Small amount. But we need to grow in our faith. We have a responsibility to put into practice that which we know to be true. And so he emphasizes who we are resting in God. But he also says that those who have faith do. Those who had faith were the obedient. And those who were disobedient, he says it was because they didn't have faith. And so good works show our faith. They do not produce, they do not produce salvation, but they often reveal whether or not we are saved. Just as good news came to those in the Old Testament concerning Yahweh's graciousness, his graciousness did not benefit them because they did not believe. And so we must see that warning and continue persevering, continue believing. Only believers enter God's rest. Whether it's Old Testament saints who believe Yahweh or us who believe Yahweh, right? We must continue to believe. So we pursue rest in God by remembering that if we're in Christ, we've entered that rest already. We're already seated in heaven. Right? Eternal life. John 17, 3. It is eternal life to know the living God and Christ the Son. So if you know the living God and Christ the Son, you're already, you're already experiencing eternal life. The second thing I want you to see is that we must pursue rest of God by remembering that we've rested from our good works in God. Look at verse number 6, and we're going to go from verse number 10. 
Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day. Today, same through David, so long afterward in the words already quoted, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. And so the Psalm of David that he's quoting is, uh, is Psalm 95, 7 through 11. And this is many years after Joshua. This is many years after Israel dying in the wilderness. This is many years after the conquering of Canaan through Joshua. Right? And the, the point he's saying is that Canaan land was a picture of a true Canaan land. And that Joshua, which, which literally means deliverer or savior, pointed ahead ultimately to the true Joshua. Did y'all know that Jesus' name is, the, is Joshua? But it's the same word. It's just in Greek. It's the same word. Yeshua. You know, it's, the, it's the same word. So when the New Testament authors are calling Jesus, Jesus, they're calling him Joshua. They're saying you're the true Joshua. You're the one who's truly going to lead us into Canaan land. All, you're going to conquer all of our enemies. You're going to deliver us. You are the Savior. You are the Deliverer. And let me be clear here. I'm not saying that Jesus was named after Joshua. I'm saying that Joshua was named after Jesus. Joshua pointed ahead to the true Joshua. And so when we read about him and the amazing things that he did, it should cause us to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice also that the Sabbath, which was Saturday in the Old Testament, was to be a picture of the rest we will experience eternally one day. Just as God rested from His work on the seventh day, enjoying His creation, we too in Christ rest from our good work concerning our salvation. For through Christ we enter God's rest forevermore. Since we are united to Christ by the Holy Spirit, and this happens at salvation, we are already in that rest from the moment we first believe. J. Vernon McGee tells this story about a man who wanted to argue about the Sabbath. The man said, I'll give you $100 if you will show me where the Sabbath day has been changed. McGee answered, I don't think it has been changed. Saturday is Saturday. It is the seventh day of the week, and it is the Sabbath day. The seventh day is still Saturday, and it is still the Sabbath day. The, guy, the fellow got a gleam in his eye and he said, then why don't you keep the Sabbath day if it hasn't been changed? And McGee answered, the day hasn't been changed, but I have been changed. I've been given a new nature now. I'm joined to Christ. I'm a part of the new creation. We celebrate the first day because that is the day he rose from the grave. And so in other words, because we're united to Christ, the reason why I don't celebrate the Sabbath today one day a week now is because every single day in Christ I'm celebrating the Sabbath. Because Christ's work is finished. And if I'm in Him, my works concerning my salvation are finished as well. And so I work now because He rose from the dead. I work now to please Him. I work now to proclaim His name to a lost and dying world. I live for His glory, not because I am earning something or meriting my salvation, but because Christ has earned it and given it to me. So I am resting every single day in Christ. So, I, so every day I'm not getting up in the morning and saying, I've got to earn my salvation today, and I make a list of things that I've got to accomplish in order to earn my salvation or keep myself saved. No, I rest. I never, I never even think about earning my salvation. Because Christ has earned it already. Christ has finished my salvation for me. I merely trust in Him and get up and live for His glory. And friend, I fail every day. And if I thought for a moment that I had to keep my salvation or earn my salvation, I could not rest. How can you sleep? 
How can you sleep if you believe you have to be good enough? If you have to, if you believe, if you believe that you must work yourself out of hell, how could you ever rest? The friend Jesus offers eternal rest. If you'll repent and believe in Him, you can rest from trusting in your good works to save you. And you can rest in His work. The question is not, is your work good enough to save you? We know the answer to that. Christ came because our works were not good enough. The question is, is His work good enough? And amen it is. So you can rest in Him. You can know that you're saved to the uttermost by simply repenting and believing in what Christ has done. And today we celebrate not the Sabbath, but the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day. A day that is still set apart. A day that is still set apart for worship. A day when we need to come together and worship. And I believe we need to teach our children about the Lord's Day. That's, that's something that our confession at this church says. But it's something that many Southern Baptist churches do not teach their children. Do not teach their young people. Sunday is the Lord's Day. The day set apart for worship. Now it's still possible, it's still okay to work. But it needs to be out of necessity. It needs to be out of, you know, it's not Sabbatarian. Where it would be sinful for work. But it should be a day that is set apart where you worship with other believers. At least once on the Lord's Day. So I want to encourage you in that. To make that commitment to base whether or not you're going to worship with other believers on Sunday based on whether or not Christ rose from the dead. Not based on how you feel. Not based on, I mean, I realize sickness and things like that. Um, but it shouldn't be, are we going to church today? <laughs> you know? It should be, it's the Lord's day. It's the Lord's day. I mean, that's what we're trying to teach our kids. To get them to understand that Sunday is the Lord's day. Sunday is the Lord's day. Sunday is the Lord's day. It's a different day than the rest of the week. We worship today. We worship with other believers today. So we've got to teach folks. And we've got to get back to where we teach children and adults that reality. It, worship has become too much about our convenience and less about God's glory. It's, it's become so much about our convenience. And friends, worship is not about our convenience. It's, it's about sacrifice. There are a million other things you can do today, and I praise God that you're here. And I want to encourage you to continue to sacrifice your time, because He's worth it. He's worth He's worth sacrificing your time. He's worth coming together. And I need, let me be clear here. I I need you to be here, not particularly as much to hear me, but so that I can hear you sing, so that I can know with all that you're going through in your life that you're still remaining faithful to the Lord. I need that. I need you. My kids need you. We need each other desperately. And many of you, I hear your prayer requests, and I know what's going on, and it is extremely comforting and encouraging to me when I look over and I see a brother or sister in Christ praising the Lord with all that I know that's going on in your life. I, I, I need you as much or more than, than you possibly need me. The third thing I want you to see, we pursue rest in God by striving to enter God's eternal rest through faith in Christ and holiness. Look what he says in verse 11. So because of these realities, because of our faith in Christ, and because of resting from our good works in God, let us therefore strive to enter that rest. So what, what an interesting thing. He says you're already in that rest, but then he says... Let us strive to enter that rest. So you have this reality where we're already there. We're already in heaven. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're adopted. We're citizens of the New Jerusalem. You know, all these wonderful realities. That is already true. However, we're not there yet physically, are we? We're not there physically yet. So let us strive to enter that rest. Let us strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. And this is what he said in verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, 
sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And so notice what he says, friend. The Word of God is living and active. The point of this is to say that we cannot hide from God. The point is to say <clears throat> that we cannot hide from God. We cannot put a mask up in front of God. <clears throat> so he's, he's saying that the Word of God pierces to the heart. That the Word of God reaches into the heart and exposes our sin to us. So that we can enjoy repentance and faith in Christ. It divides and separates that which is clean from that which is wicked. And it reveals that to us. And Michael and Michelle, Sunday school teachers, those who teach our children, those who teach the youth, this is why we teach the Bible. This is what our kids and our youth and the people of this church need the Word of God, not some self-help book. They need the Word of God more than they need just mere morality. They need the Gospel. We do not want to raise little Pharisees. We don't want to raise little self-righteous people running around that are little popes who think that they're you know, God's gift to the church. What we need are people who, yes, we need moral people, but what we need more than anything is people who know that they need Jesus. People who know that they need His finished work. That's what we need. And the way that you teach that is by teaching the Bible and then showing them that Jesus came to save us from our sin. So it's not just, it's not just be good for goodness sake. It's be good because Christ has died for you. Trust in what He has done. And so we've got to send our hearers running to Jesus Christ. If we want to change hearts, it's going to be through the preaching of the Bible. If you want to change outward behavior, you can just teach morality. And see, the danger is just seeing the Bible as a book of morality. And when you preach a story, just teaching that story and teaching the moral principles. But the point of those stories is not just the moral principles. But it's to show us that someone greater than the victor in that story is coming. I mean, when you read about David and Goliath, the ultimate point of that is not defeating giants. But it's that David, whose throne is eternal, that a greater than David is coming, who will defeat our giants for us. Ultimately, our need for forgiveness, our need for salvation who will defeat the enemies of God for us. I mean, it, it, it points ahead. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not a dual purpose there. We should. I want to be like David in his godliness and his holiness. I want to be a man after God's own heart. But David needed Jesus. And so, not just be like David, but be like David and realize you need Jesus as well. And so if we change hearts, then the maturity of our hearers rises and falls on the Scriptures. So the Word of God will transform people. Listen, I realize it can be discouraging. I realize it's so tempting to, to ask, well, is this producing fruit? Or, or do the kids like it? Or do the adults like it? And uh, the... Listen, we all, we all need feedback. We all need to, to learn from the wisdom of others. But also, we need to realize that if the Word of God reaches into your heart and exposes your sin, there's going to be times when you don't like it. Right? There's going to be times that I don't like it. But i got to preach this book. I don't know what else to preach. I mean, I could preach something else, but you might as well stay home and watch TV. We preach this book. Because this book is able to take a hardened sinner and reach in and separate and expose sin. This book, you know how many times I've said reading this book that the Lord has shown me sin 
that I was not aware of. And he just laid it out in front of me. And my only response as a believer is to repent and ask for forgiveness. And ask God to help strengthen me to please Him. And so there are there's Sundays, in Sunday school, every now and then your, your Sunday school teacher should step on your toes. And every now and then a sermon should convict your heart. Every now and then a song that is sung should pierce your heart. And if it's not, we need to ask God to intervene and work in us. Because He's still working on us. Amen? We, have, we haven't finished the race yet. We've got to keep running. And just like an Olympic athlete, all the strenuous things I've read, that they, they train four to five hours a day to prepare for the Olympics. And the crazy meals they eat, the crazy things they do. Think of all that they do for a piece for a for their name in the record book. Think about how strenuous and how disciplined they are. And friend, we're laboring for eternal life. We're laboring for something that eternity. It's unending. Most of us have forgotten a lot of the Olympic gold medals. Now some of some of you, some of you may remember. But a lot of us have forgotten those people. And you know what? Christ will never forget us. And so, friend, let us remember that we have entered His rest through faith in Christ. Let us remember that we've rested from our good works in God. And let us strive to enter God's eternal rest through faith in Christ and holiness. And so, friends, how will you respond? Perhaps you've never trusted in Christ. I want to invite you to come and put your faith in Christ. You say, Brother Jared, I'm, I'm tired of trying to earn my salvation. Well, then come. Come and rest in Christ. His works are good enough to save you and to keep you saved forevermore. Come and rest in Him. And you, you may say, Brother Jared, I've been walking at a guilty distance. Well, come and recommit your life to the Lord in front of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't leave here unchanged for this. Let us respond how God might be leading. As Brother Kenny comes, leads us in a hymn of invitation. Let's all stand and sing together.
that's fine. So we'll, we'll just move from one to the other. Um, also keep in mind uh, the Martha's ministry uh, that's coming up. If you have any questions about it, you can talk to, um, you can talk to Ms. Reba. She can give more information. Out of curiosity, how many of y'all have gotten a meal already? Like you've been in the hospital or you've been sick, how to meal raise your hand?
I can charge your dismissal. I will. See you later.